So hello and a very big welcome and thank you for joining us to discuss the future for brands and sustainability here today as part of Bite Live 2021 with a panel that's been put together in partnership with TAG. Um, in a year that the US begins to take its climate responsibilities seriously again and the UK plays host to COP26, we're delighted to be placing climate and sustainability under the microscope for the Marcoms industry here at Creative Brief. Uh, and as a result of that, we've conducted initiatives on the topic in partnership with TAG actually this year through, through, throughout the course of 21, uh, which began with TAG's report, No to Grow, and then more recently culminated with our own quant study and subsequent analysis of the findings, which I'm sure we'll refer to a little bit more today. Um, it's fair to say that despite the horrors of 2020, lockdowns caused by the pandemic have forced the benefits of a globally coordinated, environmentally conscious future into sharper focus for all of us. Uh, and the need to capitalise on that glimpse of a brighter and cleaner future and to play a core role in accelerating transition to a lower carbon economy is now more urgently imprinted on the minds of governments, business brands, agencies and consumers than ever before, I would argue. Um, the IPCC's recently published report, more emphatically than ever, links human activity to climate change and has been labelled a code red for humanity. And on top of that, a series of recent dramatic weather events in all corners of the globe have really hit home the reality. Hence, our industry needs to play its part, especially given its long-standing role in driving growth, consumption and mass consumerism. It's no longer also just a moral choice, it's increasingly a business imperative too. Uh, yet, I think the truth is the scale of the task at hand is vast and the complexity of the topic is almost unimaginable. Uh, and one thing is absolutely certain, which is that nobody has all the answers. Um, however, we have an amazing panel here today of real practitioners and thought leaders on the topic. And we're hoping for some lively debate and that may just provide one or two answers for us all today. Uh, so a very big welcome and thank you for being here to uh, Fick Volder-Georgis, I hope I've pronounced that right, <laughs> who's Marketing Director of Foods at Unilever in UK and Ireland, to Peter Zillig, Director of Marketing for Ford Europe, Tamara Lover, Division Director at TAG, uh, and Karen Fraser, Founder at Wiser Works. So a huge thank you to you all for being with us here today. Um, and without further ado, I think we're just going to dive straight in uh, and, and have a, a really open, fluid discussion on the topic. I think it's, it's worth just saying for everybody in the audience here today, because it is such a broad topic, when we could talk for hours, uh, we are going to keep, try to keep it quite focused in on, on broadly what I've, I've ruled, sort of put together as three specific areas for the dis discussion. One is around the role for the marketing function in driving the sustainability agenda. The next is sort of the role and tone of sustainability messaging within the marketing communications of brands. And the last is the, the production and resultant carbon footprint of marketing materials specifically. So that's broadly the areas we're going to look to cover. I'm sure it won't be the only areas we cover. Um, but I think kicking things off from the beginning, uh, I, I suppose the, the first question I want to just pose to the panel is really, what do they see as the future role for the marketing function in forwarding the sustainability agenda today within business and brands. You know, as, as we've talked about, there's clearly a historic correlation between you know, marketing, which is, whose role is ultimately about driving growth, and there is a correlation between growth and emissions historically. And I suppose the question really is, is what is the future role for the marketing function and how does marketing reconcile itself in a way with the apparent duality of that role? Um, Fit, can I come to you to begin with on just your, you know, your points of view on that? I think, um, Charlie, you touched upon it already. So marketing is all about driving growth ultimately, right? All the creativity, the strategy, um, the product development, everything that we do is geared towards uh, growing, um, driving business growth. And the reality is, I think, increasingly, um, everyone and anyone is beginning to know that um, the sustainability is a key driver or a key barrier of, uh, of growth in a sense that unless we take account of what is going on around us, unless we take account of what's important to our consumers and what is important to our planet, I don't think we can uh, drive growth uh, in isolation. The reality is um, we can't think of driving 
growth and building a healthy business in an unhealthy planet. So sustainability is going to be a, a very key uh, part of our strategy. And I think there are quite a lot of companies, including Unilever, who've realized that a long time ago, our sustainability plan, for example, was done uh, decades ago. And similarly, quite a lot of companies are waking up to that and marketing as a beating heart, as the engine of many organizations will be a key, key driver of making sure that sustainability is part of the business model for growth. Okay. okay, brilliant. And, and Vic, I think when we have chatted in uh, recent weeks, you, you talked to me a bit about a sort of a audacious plan in a way of Unilever that I think Alan Jope has, uh, has announced about doubling growth whilst effectively halving impact. Is that, is that, are they the right stats that I've, I've drawn on? <laughs> yes, so absolutely. So we've had this uh, before with um, uh, our former CEO as well, Paul Pullman, and also now currently our current CEO, Alan, is also quite focused on that. The reality is, yes, you have to grow your business. That's what we want. That's what we're all doing. That's what we are here for. But ultimately, we have to realize that growing business does not have to come at the expense of the planet. In fact, helping the planet could be a key uh, drive, uh, grow the, uh, growth driver rather uh, for the business. So the, the whole idea is to think about how do we build, how do we incorporate the sustainability initiatives as part of the business initiatives and as part of the business model, effectively reinventing the business model as opposed to just treating sustainability either as a reputation risk or as a nice to do something that we do on a kind of on a Friday afternoon. It has to be part and parcel of our growth driver. And that's the only time I think you can make a, a substantial difference both in growth, but also in the health of uh, people and planet. Okay, brilliant. And, and Peter, can I come to you as sort of the other the brand on the panel, and I suppose you know marketing practitioner in in place in role at the moment here. Um, uh, you know, and, and obviously, you know, the, the auto industry is in an interesting place, right? Because the historically has been a fairly significant polluter, um, and uh, but but there are some major changes afoot. And I suppose that you know the question I'm interested in with you is, is it possible to, you know, in in your industry to to continue to to continue growth while reducing impact, you know, environmental impact, and what's and yeah. what's marketing's role within that? Yeah, absolutely, Charlie. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I've actually only been with, with Ford for just over a year in this role. And one of the key things for me uh, in taking the job and deciding to take it was getting assurances actually around Ford's commitment to sustainability and to electrifying uh, their product range. I, I certainly wasn't going to join Ford to, uh, to sell more petrol and diesel vehicles over the next five to 10 years. So I, I sought some strong assurances around that. I think, um, I think it's important that, that we don't view um, the sustainability message as a, as a tool for marketing, if I can put it that way. I think it's really important that we view we it as a fundamental commitment of the business, which marketing actually then needs to harness. Um, and, and fundamentally, you know, for Ford, it was about earning our customers' trust. That is the most important thing. Um, you know, what I would say is that I think marketing is, is uniquely positioned to help. Um, as marketeers, we have tools that are critical to addressing the climate crisis because we can help change the way people feel, the way they think, and ultimately the way they behave. Um, and so we're, we're in a lucky position. And we know that creativity and innovation you know, thrive under constraints like this. You know, it's, it's an opportune moment, I think, to bring creativity to the fore. Um, you know, from, a, from a forward perspective, um, you know, we, we obviously want to grow as a company, just as, as, as Unilever do, as we've just mentioned. And, you know, alongside that, though, we have some very clear goals. You know, we will fully electrify our passenger vehicle range by 2030, which is obviously only eight years away now. And we will have two thirds of our commercial vehicles also fully electrified by, by 2030 as well. So huge change and transformation. Yeah. And when you think about it, you know, 75% of our emissions as a company come from an exhaust pipe. You know, the rest comes from manufacturing processes and suppliers. And so if we can get more of our customers, both commercial and retail customers, into electrified vehicles, then we're making a huge step change in terms of our uh, carbon footprint. But we're also encouraging uh, people to, to make that transition into, into much more sustainable vehicles. And it was interesting, actually, I was reading a report the other day, I think it was from Cantar in 2020, um, and and it, it's, it's key that, you know, consumers are expecting more from companies, obviously. And those, those companies that have a positive impact on society 
are growing at two and a half times the rate of other companies. So in doing these things, you can feel good. Yeah, okay, brilliant. And, and yeah, you've talked to me, and I'm going to come back to this. You've talked to me about some interesting statistics, I think, in terms of the focus and direction for your marketing activity, actually, and spend areas and all that sort of stuff. Perhaps we'll come back to that a little bit later in the discussion. Yep. Um, but Karen, I, I know also when, when we've talked, you, you talked a lot, in, I think, about your opinion around the, the importance of marketing in, in sort of making greener choices more appealing, actually, for, for consumers in this day and age. And that sounds a bit like what Peter's talking about, I think, in, in the context of Ford. Yeah. Is that- you know, for me, there are two elements to marketing's contribution that make me very optimistic and, and feel positive. The first is happening already in terms of the changes in the way that we're producing ads. So COVID clearly made uh, you know, everybody stop. And you know, it was a, an enforced stop and people took the time to reflect. And I know your own study showed that 76% of leaders had, had re-evaluated and changed their strategy during 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, and people are already, you know, with the help of companies like TAG, they're, they're changing the way that they approach production. But the second element is, is every bit as exciting uh, and, and one that we're about to see happening, I think, is, is, ha- is the role that marketing can play in making greener choices more exciting, more attractive. Um, and, and I think that's where the, the greatest challenge is, and it also will have the greatest impact on, on carbon um, in, impacts across the marketing industry, across our, all of our industries, which marketing serves. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. And and I, there's one thing I, I don't want to spend lots of time on this because it's a complex discussion. But I know the um, the IPA, for example, and and lots of organisations associated to them are looking at all sorts of ways of you know measurements. Uh, um, and, and I know that the Ben Essen at Iris has been quite involved with the IPA on on something called eco effectiveness, which is sort of looking at not just measuring marketing marketing activity from the point of view of ROI. It's a classic ROI, but but measuring around what I think what they term sort of return on carbon, uh, which without going into loads of details about maximizing financial return to business for every ton of CO2 emitted. And I th- like one really interesting point within that, though, that I just wanted to pose to you as the panel was um, uh, a sort of there's talk about digging deeper into really understanding what and, and analyzing the marketing activity of brands and really understanding what marketing activity can best generate financial return whilst also over time decreasing impact. Is that something, again, I suppose for, for Peter and Fick at this point, just that, that your brands are looking at or doing or sort of involved in at this point? Yeah, yeah let me um, cool. Let me start. So, absolutely. So, I think um, kind of if you think about it from a sustainability angle, the key thing, one of the key reasons why sustainability is not as commonplace in the business world as we wish it were, um, is because of the fact that it is seen as a sustainability and growth are usually seen as mutually exclusive, right? So, it's either seen as something that is nice to do, as I said earlier, in terms of as a Friday afternoon activity, as a moral imperative, as a, rather than as a business imperative, or it's seen as something that if we do engage with it, it might actually prevent growth, uh, etc. So now the, the idea is to say how we flip that on its head and actually use sustainability initiatives to try and help us grow the business. And it can be done. And we've seen it, we've proven it again and again. You quoted, I think Peter quoted uh, the number earlier around Kantar and how brands with sustainable initiatives grow 2.5 uh, times more than others. And we've seen it in our business in Unilever as well. Our brands that are heavily involved in this area do grow faster than those that are not. And it's relatively uh, it's easier than what, than, than what we think in the sense that ultimately, because consumers are leaning into the space, shoppers are leaning into this place. The average citizen is kind of really embracing this area. It just goes to reason that by kind of leaning into this area, of course, not only do we do good to the planet, but also we align ourselves to what the kind of the big trends are to our consumers, to our shoppers, to the average citizen, citizen on the streets. 
An example I can give you in terms of how you can integrate a board uh, would be um, one of our brands in foods, for example, Hellman's, uh, placed in the area of food waste. Now, you might think, I mean, food waste, what is it? What's the connection between food waste uh, and sustainability? The reality is when you think of, um, when you look at food waste, uh, almost a third of food produced globally every year goes to waste, right? A third. That's just mind boggling, especially given the fact that, you know, nearly a billion people go hungry. But it's not just that. The planetary impact is also incredible in a sense that uh, if you think of food waste, it is the third biggest uh, greenhouse gas uh, emitter next to the likes of US and China. So it's, it's a big deal. Now, this is something that we can lean in in terms of making sure that it's not just the brand, but also our shoppers are aware of what's happening in the space and the fact that they could do something on a day-to-day -day basis. So we campaign a lot around the space. We talk about this, both on our kind of communication or our product, uh, on our giving them both inspiration as well as um, uh, equipping them with you know day-to-day -day ideas that will help us deal with that you know, carrot that's um, uh, just sitting in the back of our fridge. And it does help in a sense that consumers do like and do uh, respect the fact that we're leaning into that, but also they're really happy with the fact that we are not only giving equipping them with the right facts, but also with a way of making sure that they reduce, they help contribute individually to the bigger idea of food waste. So uh, net, net, to go back to your question, Charlie, yes, it can be done. It's just a matter of making sure that we adjust our mindset in terms of saying sustainability and business growth are not mutually exclusive. They can actually be one and the same. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. No, I, I would agree with that, Vic. And I guess, in, in a way, we're very fortuitous in the automotive industry in the sense that clearly electrification is the future. Uh, and therefore, you know, as I described earlier, moving in that direction automatically reduces emissions by a very, very large amount. Um, you know, if you look across Europe, uh, Norway is in fact the market with the highest percentage of electrified vehicles. Over 65% of vehicles that are sold in Norway are fully electrified. Um, we took a choice this year to actually invest 75% of our passenger vehicle budget in our electrified models. So not totally electric, there's one model which is to totally electric, the rest are hybrid and electrified. And, and you know, we've seen the rewards of that in the sense that nearly 50% of the passenger vehicles we've sold this year, having invested that budget, are electrified. So we've seen a big shift in terms of you know, where our customer base is going. So we, we made a strategic decision around our marketing investment, and we've seen validation of that in terms of sales, which is obviously therefore benefiting our carbon footprint. The last thing I'll pick up on is, is you know, creating excitement around this, this sort of transformation as well from a marketing perspective. And Karen, you referenced this as well. I think historically there was, there was almost a trade-off between, you know, in previous generations, you know, products that worked and products that were good for the planet. You know, that is, that is no longer the case. Um, you know, we're, we're just about to launch the Mustang mach -E GT, which is our fastest all-electric vehicle. And that will rival the most powerful V8 engines in terms of acceleration. It's huge. So you can make a really green choice around a very exciting vehicle and not have to compromise. Um, and I think that's, that's a huge change as well in terms of the opportunity that marketing has to promote better choices that are just as good and just as exciting as other products out in the market. Yeah. And Peter, is that, uh, you know, the, the fact that, you know, your, your category and your sort of industry is so clear cut in terms of the direction that sustainability is, you know, almost sort of key to survival, right? I mean, is that, is that clarity of focus actually quite liberating for you and for the business? Absolutely. It's wonderful. I mean, you know, we, we know we're doing the right thing for the planet. We know we're doing the right thing for the business. We know we're doing the right thing in terms of where the industry is headed. Frankly, the key challenge we have is how quickly can we get there? Can we get there faster than our competitors? So it's a huge driving force right now within the company, within the industry. There is no other option. So it is quite liberating because it makes the choices much simpler. Yeah. And Tamara, just coming to you, I mean, you know, you obviously work with a range of brands, um, many of whom I'm sure are grappling with all sorts of complexity around these issues and you know because it is such a hugely complex topic right and I, I assume that not many of them are quite as as lucky as uh, as Peter is in terms of the, the sort of clarity of focus and there are a lot of decisions to be made and there's a lot of grappling with commitment within the business and all sorts of stuff but I mean just just broadly what what are you seeing in this space 
Yeah, no, I, I think that's really fair. To be honest with you, it's such a complex issue and there's so many different variables of how to tackle it. it it's quite tricky. And I think one of the key things that we try to do at TAG to help clients on this journey is give them simple tools and, and guidance and ways of how we could help them along that journey. And, and the analogy that I always think about is, I don't know if you're familiar with the app of Couch to 5K. And it's, it just really takes something that seems so daunting, you know, running 5K if you've never run it before and gives you that, you know, that clear path. And I think sustainability is the same thing. You know, what are the tools that we could use to start by measuring and helping them to understand what, what their footprint is? And then what are the steps that they could take to reduce it? And the funny thing is we were talking about whether, you know, it comes at a cost or, you know, are they mutually exclusive? And in the world of production, it's actually not. It, oftentimes, the sustainable option is actually the more cost-effective option, which is such a fantastic thing because it makes it a no-brainer. Like an example of what I'm talking about, if you think about um, the number one contributor of carbon emissions within, it, um, within production is the shoot, the travel. You know, by reducing the number of travelers that go or virtual uh, shoots, that has such tremendous impact. You know, an international shoot will produce a hundred tons of carbon. That is something that we could easily reduce by just taking simple actions that cost less money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. Now, I know that for shooting local, some of the clients that I'd spoke to, they'd reduce their carbon impact by a factor of 40. Mm. It can be astonishingly good for the environment, but also very good for finances. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's really the case. It's the number one um, uh, sort of emissions creator, is it, tomorrow on shoot production is actually just the travel to get there. Yeah. What our philosophy when it comes to shooting is trains, not planes or public transportation where possible. You know, the more you could shoot local, use local crews will have a tremendous. In fact, Karen, you said it spot on. A local shoot is 40 times less carbon emission than an international one. Right. Yeah. And actually, I think this, Peter was talking earlier about trust, uh, consumer trust in, in sustainable comms. I think this is a really essential component because consumers don't look at ads produced in isolation. They look at them and think, hold on, this brand's got a sustainability message, but I can see that they've flown to Argentina to produce their commercial. And there's a disconnect there. So people mm -hmm. want to see evidence of, of brands acting sustainably in every aspect of their communications in their on-screen stuff, but also obviously using packaging and what, what turns up when an item's delivered to your home. If those things aren't clearly put together with thought and sustainability in mind, that's where consumers' trust falls. And uh, YouGov's study last year uh, found that 70% 70, 70 of consumers are skeptical about brands sustainability communications. So there's a risk there if, if people don't attend to all the elements of the marketing campaign. Yeah. Let, let's talk a bit more about trust, actually, Karen. That's, I mean, I was going to come to that a bit later, but now we've brought it up. I think it's a, it's a good good opportunity to talk about it because, and, and that stat particularly as well is interesting about 70% of consumers are sort of, um, what is it, sceptical about uh, brand sustainability claims in, in communications? I think rightly so. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But interestingly, in, in the survey that we've just conducted with senior marketers, um, it was, I think the stat was over, just over 55% of marketers um, felt that consumers believed sustainability claims in advertising. So that's quite an interesting mismatch in a way in the stat. I don't know how recent that 70% number was. The last year. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. But yeah, and trust is an area, obviously, you've done a lot on, Karen, in advertising, not just in the context of sustainability, right, but, but sort of trust as a whole and the erosion of trust in, in the advertising industry. Um, and, and FIC, I think, again, you know, I, I know for a fact that even probably three or four years ago, 
uh, Alan Jobe, I think, at, at Cannes was talking about, and this was before the topic really of sustainability, but was talking about purpose washing of brands and the danger of purpose washing um, and the erosion of trust that that was creating. So this, this goes back a long way, right? But Karen, what, what is your sort of perspective uh, generally on, on trust and sustainability at the moment and what you're seeing? Um, as, as we've discussed before, Charlie, I'm mildly obsessed in, in the gap between, um, you know, actions, and, and words and um, and the thing that I, I keep coming back to is comp- how how cl- uh, savvy consumers are about what companies are really doing so w- clearly where there's the greatest gap between what companies are doing and what companies are saying to people to consumers that's where the greatest risk exists so again I think uh, you know companies like Ford um, like Unilever, who are already committed, are in a much safer place than those who haven't yet brought their marketing um, plans in, in line with their sustainability ambitions. So in the survey that we did together, Charlie, we heard a lot of that, didn't we? We heard mm-hmm. that during COVID, brands had taken this pause, they'd reset their, their, um, their business, and that was reflected in new strategies. But then people who were tasked with delivering marketing campaigns are saying, oh, God, I've got some very, very um, major ambitions now that I need to work hard to to realise. So there's a bit of a gap between companies' ambitions and what people are currently equipped to do. And I think one of the most interesting things that we talked about with clients is how they're going to um, reduce that gap and therefore reduce the risk to their business. Yeah. And Tamara, what, what are you seeing there from, I mean, I assume you're seeing a huge range with your clients of those who are genuinely committed and want to communicate that very clearly and others who are beginning the journey and want to begin to communicate it. But I'm sure you're seeing some who are probably not taking it quite as seriously as they should be, but but still want to sort of ride the wave of it and talk about it in, in comms. What's your general advice to those brands? Uh, yeah, you know, it's true. There, There is a range, but I would say overall, I'm so excited about the amount of clients that I work with that are taking it very seriously and are looking for um, ways to really help, um, help them along on that journey. I think one of the key things really starts by giving, helping them to measure. Measurement is such a, a, a key part of this whole process. So helping them to understand kind of where they are and then moving them along on their journeys, giving them the different tools. But what I would say is the brands that are really serious about it are, are moving to action and moving to action quickly. You know, one of the key things is unless you make sustainability a priority and put it at the, the beginning of the process, you won't be successful. And that starts with a creative idea. If you're thinking about sustainability by the time you already have a, a storyboard and you're ready to shoot, you've missed so many opportunities to really um, have an impact. So I would say the key is to make it a priority. Just like you measure ad effectiveness along the journey, you wouldn't shoot a creative idea without um, speaking to consumers. The same thing about sustainability, putting it at the heart. And when you come up with a creative concept, there's so many ways we could adjust it or, or make it more effective from a sustainability standpoint as well. And, and Peter and, and Fick, can I just ask your point of view? And actually, Karen, I suspect you will have a point of view on this as well, having... Um, interviewed quite a lot of brands for the report that you produced with TAG earlier this year. I suppose the question I have is, it, you know, generally we see, you know, more brands taking sustainability more seriously, more, and not just more brands, by the way, more businesses and organisations across the board taking sustainability more seriously and knowing partly, partly that their consumers demanding it, knowing probably that there's going to be more government regulation coming in and taxation and all sorts of things that demand it as well. Um, but yeah, it, it seems that uh, marketing, uh, that, you know, the role for marketing within the organisation of driving that sustainability agenda is is becoming greater and greater. And, and I suppose the question I have is just how well equipped do you think marketers feel to take this sort of leading role in the issue of the day? And 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 you know, if not so equipped, how can they ultimately get more comfortable with that role, both internally and externally? Fick, yeah. shall I start with you on that one? 
Uh, that's, that's a great question. So I think, um, firstly, let me just uh, 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 touch upon the, was the kind of the concept, the think do gap, um, both Karen um, and also Tamara touched upon. I think that, that exists for a very good reason in terms of one is, um, uh, of, of course, from a consumer side, there's a lot of skepticism around greenwashing, et cetera, because there is a lot of greenwashing in, uh, in brands and businesses, right? And part of that uh, is as a result of, of course, a little bit of complacency in terms of brands kind of saying, let me just jump on the bandwagon. And then another part is, I think also, Tamara, as you said, it's this idea of thinking about sustainability further down the line as opposed to upstream, right? So I think either way, as a result of that, and the other part is what you've just mentioned, Charlie, in terms of our uh, market is equipped to begin with to think about this space. Do they know what they're talking about and therefore can they influence action? And uh, that's also another component of that. So yeah. either way, with a combination of all three, ultimately there's a gap between um, words versus deeds, right? So we are more on the, I think if we're honest with ourselves as an industry, there's quite a lot of people who are in the brands who are in the words bit as opposed to in the deeds bit, right? So there's a movement, but still uh, there's the majority still sitting in the words area. Now, in terms of our market is equipped, I think uh, they increasingly, yes, I don't think we are there yet as an industry. Increasingly, I think I'm, uh, I'm seeing a lot more brands and businesses increasingly find, figuring out, firstly, coming to terms with sustainability. As you said, this is a, com a very complex uh, area. So it's not something that we are trained from from the beginnings. It's not something that we are very well aware of in terms of what does carbon emission, what does it take to take carbon emission in half? What does it take to make sure that the Paris Accord lives in tw by, by 2050, the, all the, the goals are made? What we have, probably most of us don't have that much clue, but the reality is we, we have to make it our business to find out exactly how we can contribute, how our brands and our businesses can contribute towards that. And the point is not just about, I think, uh, kind of pushing it to consumers and saying, I will communicate, I'll raise awareness, et cetera. It's not just that. It's the end-to-end -end value chain we need to look at and say whether it's starting from production uh, of our goods and services to how they're consumed, to how we produce our communication, to Tamara's point, in terms of uh, our um, ads, et cetera. Every bit of our, um, uh, our value chain is what we need to evaluate. And also, it's not we have to realize that it's not just something that brands can do on their own. We have to partner with our agency partners. It's not just the client side, the agency side. Everyone has to come, kind of come to terms with it and hold hands to make this happen. But unless we tackle this in terms of building up our knowledge and how we're equipped to tackle this, unless we look at this area, then we really struggle to make uh, any uh, moves or any move the dial in this particular area. Yeah. Charlie, one point that I just wanted to build on what you said, because I completely agree with you, Fick, is one of the challenges is there's not a universal way, or at least there hasn't been a universal way where everybody could measure. So there is a degree of authenticity or truth to what you're actually doing. And one exciting thing is the Ad Green is coming up with a carbon calculator on September 29th, which will give the industry like a, a universal measuring stick. And imagine a world in uh, next year where every uh, award submission asks, you know, what was your carbon emission uh, on this production? You know, then we start to get to a point where it becomes a priority for the industry. Consumers can see it and it's universal. So I, I think there's some exciting changes on the horizon that will help with that. Yeah. Couldn't agree with you more, Tamara. I think this whole idea of the kind of the ad net zero concept, how that um, volunteer organization came together, and actually that is chaired by our GM, by the, our UK GM as well. The whole idea of just making sure that we focus on this and have the same yardstick that we can measure by and we can communicate freely between organizations to say this is how we're moving the needle. That was a critical barrier, and the fact that it's now here would help this advance our cause even better. And, th and that Ad Green uh, initiative tomorrow is about um, emissions in created during shoot produ production specifically, right? Well, yeah, it's all different types. Uh, it's, it's in marketing creation, yes, but it's yeah, yeah. for yeah. shoot calculator, post-production, editing. Okay, okay. And, and Peter, just, uh, you know, sticking with the, the sort of question around how well equipped do marketers feel? I mean, you know, again, you, you and, and Fick are fortunate to be in, in businesses that are taking this really, really seriously, um, not just from a marketing point of view, but right the way across the board, you know, from the top. Um, but I mean, 
And, 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 you know, actually in our findings, by the way, in the survey, I mean, thankfully, the, the, the biggest barriers that, that seemed to be, you know, something like 70 percent of, of the total of the, the kind of barriers that marketers talked to us about were much more around speed and scale of change required and keeping track of that and sort of the cost of more sustainable options. But actually, thankfully, you know, it was less than 10 percent of responses were talking about a challenge with commitment from the wider business. But I suppose the question is, you know, how far can marketers take this and drive it on their own versus how much do they really need to be in businesses that are absolutely 100 percent committed to this? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I personally feel in answer I mean, your, your initial question quite directly. But I don't think marketeers are necessarily equipped to, to lead this charge at present, nor do I actually think they should be doing it in isolation. Clearly, you know, we can't view, uh, or view marketing as a discipline that is doing this um, on its own, this isn't about a veneer, this has to be systemic. And I think that's the point you're making. And, you know, it is across the whole supply chain that the company needs to be truly invested. Um, you know, Ford as, as an automotive uh, manufacturer, I think was, was actually the first in the industry to, to produce a state sustainability report over 20 years ago, now, which was actually led by Bill Ford. So we put a stake in the ground nearly two decades ago. And, you know, even if I look at the company sort of purpose, that is also, you know, really deep rooted. It was always, always about freedom of movement, obviously, going back to Henry Ford. It's now about freedom of movement, but in a better world. So it's at the heart of the company. Every, every department, everybody is thinking about it. Um, and for me, it's, you know, definitely about teamwork. Um, you know, I, I need to lean on so many different parts of the company to make sure that when we do go to market with a message that contains an element of sustainability within it in terms of either reporting or data or facts or whatever it might be, that what we're doing is not skin deep, that it is truly systemic. And I think to Karen's earlier point, if the customer does go digging harder and is looking for further proof or validation of what they're talking about, that they find it. Because if they don't, we'll lose their trust, which brings us full circle back to the beginning of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it has to be systemic. And Karen, in, in the report that you conducted, where you, I think you spoke to 15 or so senior marketers, didn't you, about the, about the topic? I mean, you know, what, what was the feeling there? What, did they feel equipped? Did they feel overwhelmed? Uh, and, and I suppose, importantly, if they were in businesses that weren't, um, you know, absolutely systemically committed, did they feel that they were able to influence and and sort of harness some energy and momentum around sustainability to get the industry more yeah, behind it yeah so i i must admit i approached the the project with some degree of skepticism about the levels of commitment across the board but i was i was happily surprised by everybody that i spoke to who you know they really underlined the renewed um, vision of the companies that they were working for and the scale of the ambitions but you know, to answer your question about their, you know, their feelings of being equipped or informed, then that then many people felt because the challenge was so great, because the company had made such a huge commitment, they now were lagging behind a bit in terms of their understanding of the scale of the problem and where they can make the best contribution. And and I think it, it, it's it's right to to be so because the you know the, the scale of of the overall problem is beyond our comprehension. It's not just about the way that we we use products. It's about the way that products are created. So how steel is made, how we transport goods, how we power the goods that we buy, and what we do in terms of recycling them. And most people consumers, I mean, and us who work in marketing, most people tend to be focused on the recycling element mm -hmm. rather than the way that things are made, created and powered. So yeah. uh, uh, to, my, to my, the point I made earlier, it, it, for me, that's where the most exciting challenge of all is that we as, as responsible marketers can help people to understand where the best choices are without bamboozling them with you yep. know, science, which is, is too complicated and, and too overwhelming for most of us to, to, to comprehend quickly. I, I agree with that, Karen. I think simplicity is, is absolutely key because I think sometimes this, this climate crisis can feel really inaccessible for people. You know, it's filled with acronyms, complex charts, jargon, 
and it, and it can feel like a bit of insurmountable challenge. So I think we've got to be grounded in the science, but that doesn't mean we have to be worthy. I think we've got to ditch the hair shirts and help people see what's in it for me. I think it's really important in simple language. I think that's a key challenge for marketing. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think one, of, one of the best things that we collectively can do is help to inspire hope in, in people. Because where, where people have hope, they're more likely to make better choices. Yeah. yeah. And that sort of leads nicely on to, I suppose, just a, a bit of conversation around the, you know, the, the tonality in, in marketing and advertising communications around sustainability today. I mean, you know, one of the things I think that, that we've observed at Creative Brief, it, it, even just this year, is a, a sort of an evolution, actually, and a change in the tone, I think, that, it, that brands are using in their messaging around sustainability in Marcoms. You know, and I, I, I sort of look around the, the market and I look at brands like Sainsbury's, you know, the, the tone has actually become much more light and sort of airy and modern, innocence using humour around the topic. IKEA is very accessible. You know, Ford, Peter, you know, a lot of the, the work is sort of fun and aspirational. Uh, you know, Hellman's Vic, obviously, you know, you've talked about food waste, but, you know, Hellman's British Gas, those sorts of brands doing a lot, of, you know, that's very sort of practical and helpful. Um, and and that, that feels to me like a, a change, even from 12 months ago, from a slightly more sort of worthy tone is what what is the panel's point of view on that have you seen that and do you do you agree with that and and why is that happening in your opinion yeah i i would i would agree with that charlie i think um you know we we certainly view this as an opportunity we certainly view it as exciting and we want our customers to feel that excitement um you know as you know we, we sign off all of our, our work in in Europe with, with Anne line of Bring On Tomorrow, which is clearly about, you know, a real optimism around the future. Um, and to your point, you know, if you look again at, around the way we're, we're launching some of these vehicles now, you know, I'll choose Mackie as an example, because it's most, the most recent, you know, we could have just introduced that as an electrified vehicle in, in a fairly straightforward way. We chose to, step, you know, to tap into the soul and the swagger of that vehicle. You know, the Mustang has a lot of soul and swagger but it's electrified and doing all the right things in terms of green choices and, and, and you know, where you should be heading as a customer. So managing to combine those things, I think it's becoming much easier. And to your point, therefore leading towards a tonality of communication, which I think is, is less worthy. It still needs to be authentic, but I think we're seeing a more uplifting tone to a lot of what people are doing. Okay, yeah. And Fick, how do you feel about that? I agree. I think uh, a kind of sustainability tended to be, uh, if you look back a decade uh, ago, a couple of years ago, in fact, it tended to be um, quite, uh, as you said, worthy and preachy. That's kind of the tonality we took from a messaging point of as an industry. And I think that was also partly because of kind of the realization of the enormity of the problem that is out there. And then there was this urgency for marketers to almost jolt everyone around them out of their uh, reverie. So they kind of took the, oh my God, look at, at what, what's happening. We need to wake up type of route. And often that was the kind of the complex route as opposed to something that brings it down to earth to the everyday situation. Now, I think um, the reality is consumer shoppers, citizens, et cetera, the, the knowledge is out there in the sense that there's quite a lot of people, consumers who, have, who are leaning into this, as I said earlier. Um, in, in most cases, in fact, consumers are way ahead of us in terms of the level of knowledge they have in this area. That still doesn't mean that we don't have a role to play in communicating and raising, and raising awareness, et cetera. We have a big, big role in that space. Now, the role has changed slightly in terms of, instead of just uh, sounding the alarm bells, it's more around, uh, firstly, uh, to Karen's point, there's, a, there's a, a role we play in terms of inspiring consumers. And then secondly, also, there's a role we play, and as part of the inspiration is also demystifying some of these big jargons, concepts, et cetera, that we keep on throwing around. There's a role in there. And then the second part of it is also there's a role in equipping consumers. It's not just about inspiration and just leaving them out there, but actually giving them everyday practical needs so that they can actually say, I have a role to play. I have a part to play in actually um, uh, trans uh, impacting uh, the climate crisis we're in and reducing the climate crisis in, in we're in they become partners as opposed to 
um, you know, somebody we're just talking down to. That's that shouldn't be the case, and that was the case a couple of years back. Now it's more around how can we partner so that together we can actually move that dial when it comes to cl- climate crisis. That's where we are, I think. Yeah, and I assume that that sort of sense of partnership that you then develop also comes back to the point about trust. You know, if you're if you're in partnership, there's likely to be more trust between the two rather mm. than being sort of talked down yeah. to. Yeah. Uh, depends depends on the source of the message, though, doesn't it? <coughs> uh, Lee has got a lovely, uh, kind of light-hearted um, brand campaign, and and then corn as well, humorous and fun. But if you're a fossil fuel company, that's probably not the right tone for you. So, yeah, yeah. very much down to where where your brand, who your brand is, and, and where you're coming from, because people consumers have really long memories. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I think the, the tonality is the how, right? How do we deliver the message? But the what is critical, equally, even more so critical in a sense that unless it's a brand or a business, Karen, to your point, that is kind of quite transparent and consistent and authentic about this um, sustainability area. It doesn't, how we deliver it does not make a difference. It's not about how we deliver the message. We have to start from the what in terms of what we stand for. How does it impact our strategy? How do we actually actively drive sustainability? And then the delivery also does matter, but it, we have to start from the what. Yeah. And those things absolutely must be consistent. Yes. The, the what and the how needs to match. I agree. I agree. And that's the gap that a lot of people are trying to close at the moment. <laughs> Um, and, and on that, I mean, I, I'm keen, to, for, I suppose, probably for the last sort of five minutes or so that we've got just to, to talk about, uh, you know, again, coming back to the, the carbon footprint produced by the production of marketing materials specifically and, and the role that the, the, the industry as a whole has to play in reduction of that, of, of emissions in that space, um, which obviously I think was a big focus of, of TAG's report, right, Tamara and, and Karen, um, no to grow. Um, you know, again, interestingly, our, our recent study found that a pretty significant number, 42% of brands say that they are now more closely scrutinizing um, and sort of changing their behaviors in this in this arena. Though I think, if I'm really honest, a lot of them, when you look at the comments in that survey, you know, there's a lot of discussion around it being embryonic or nascent or, you know, just setting out. Um but yeah, I, I think the you know a stat that really hit me uh, when uh, I think this was in um, a, a video that you sent me, Karen, around from from IPA actually an IPA effectiveness case study. But the annual emissions of the ad industry in the UK are one one million tons. But uh, you know, just the Audi campaign, advertising campaign for Audi from two, from twenty fifteen to twenty seventeen, I think the, the level of incremental sales that that drove led to a further 5 million tonnes of carbon emissions. And that's just on one brand and that's just advertising. And that's so you, that sort of starts, which is the equivalent, by the way, to 1.3 coal power stations running for an entire year, day and night, which I found a fascinating stat. But, I mean, you start to see when you then add all that up what the, what the true impact of the industry looks like, which is quite scary. Um, and to Tamara, can we just come to you? Because obviously this is a, a topic that's really on the on the lips of TAG at the moment. Yeah. What's your point of view here? How do we move forward? Well, there's no question that production <clears throat> is a key contributor of carbon within the marketing industry. But I think for a TAG, we are empowered to be able to change that because we work with so many great clients and produce hundreds of thousands of assets a year where it's critical for us to be a leader in this space. And One of the most exciting things is how technology is a huge enabler right now to help us. You know, when you think about, you know, the the million tons of carbon or even the thousand tons that are generated from a shoot, what we have now are things that just a few years ago we would have thought were impossible are now tools that we could use to help tackle this problem. And I'll give you a couple examples. Um, One of the things is using virtual sets now instead of building um, sets, not only back to our earlier conversation, more cost effective because you're not buying all the wood, spending extra shooting days to set up the set. Um, 
the great thing is now, um, if it's you're also using green screen, can be changed and adapted for different markets. So you're not only getting the carbon efficiency of how it was shot, but you're also getting the carbon efficiency of asset reuse and being able to change it. And it becomes even greater if the all the editing and post production is happening in a space that's powered by renewable energy. So there's so many things that we could do that don't require tremendous change. It requires understanding of technology of what's out there, a willingness to try something new. But, you know, it, all of these things could have a, a tremendous impact. And we're starting to use these things now. There's a client that we work with um, that we just started to do a test using the virtual sets. And they're extremely excited about that. There's another client uh, Bacardi that we shot one um, shoot completely virtually um, during COVID. So imagine two years ago, if I told um, my client that we were going to shoot a, a TV commercial, but there was going to be no director on site, no crew, no advertising uh, d- uh, director, no, not even a brand team, you'd say I was crazy. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. And now, not only did we do it, it was a phenomenal spot that everybody's really proud of. So it can be done. We're doing it and we just need to start, start yeah. by starting. And, and it's not just, you know, it's not just the production of advertising and sort of video content either that we're talking about here, right? It's also, you know, we should, we should acknowledge packaging, recy- recycling, recyclable sort of point of sale materials. It's yes. the, whole, the whole chain, isn't it? I'm so glad you brought that up too, Charlie, because that is a huge area of opportunity. So one of our clients that we work with, O2, um, the POS that they built every year for their Christmas store displays is huge. And, and in 2020, we built the entire display completely recyclable. So <clears throat> we were able to reduce, I think, the material, the um, footprint by 98%. And every single piece of that display ended up recycled. So we're thinking about end of life in store. It's, it's really the full chain from, you know, every every social content or every TVC you create down to what's happening in store and on web. Every single things can be Im- impacted and reducing the carbon. So it, it's exciting. There's so many different areas. And, and Peter and Fick, just, I mean, we don't have a lot of time, but just quickly, are you, are both of your brands thinking about those areas? Oh, absolutely. I think it goes back. Oh, sorry, Peter, go on. No, you, you go first. I was saying you go first. Oh, okay. So uh, I, we are absolutely thinking about that, Charlie. So uh, as I said, um, and also to Tamara's point uh, earlier, uh, consistency and authenticity is critical uh, in this business. So we can't just look at one part of our organization and not have the other parts being um, sustainable. So we look at our end-to-end chain and advertising production, uh, whether it's from a POS angle or even the shoots, et cetera, that is also a key part of what we look at. Uh, and Tamara, it just makes me smile when you talk about how everything can be done virtually. I can just imagine, imagine growing up in this business. I, there's no way I could have thought, you know, this could be done without a director in set or a brand manager. I mean, God forbid. Uh, but the <laughs> fact that you're saying it could be done, what a fantastic thing. Uh, music to uh, sustainability, yes, but also to our financial books as well. Yeah, no, I think I think we look at it both from a strategic perspective, but also from a tactical perspective. I guess strategically, it's who are we partnering with? Um, you know, that's really key. So as we look at our, all of our agency partners across the whole marketing supply chain, you know, making sure that they are not step with our commitments as a company. So if I look at, for instance, um, you know, WPP, a huge partner uh, for Ford over over many many years, you know, they've got a commitment across their entire supply chain. I think to be Net zero by, by 2030. That's really important to us that they've made that commitment. You know, ultimately, we're looking for, for net zero media plans at some point, right? They live up to that. Um, and then, if I look at, you know, BBO, which is another key, key supplier um, of ours within the Omnicom network, you know, they've signed up obviously to um, for the Ad Green initiative and we're fully supportive of that. So, so, those big strategic decisions around partnerships and now how their behavior is important. But then also, some of the examples of insights, you know, during COVID. Uh, we, we conducted plenty of shoots where we didn't send clients to the shoot. All the approvals were remote uh, on calls like this, and it, and it worked perfectly well. And then all, all the way down to looking at you know production companies that we work with. You know, how do they, for instance, think about um, recycling, you know, food and everything else that's involved in the shoot um, and the waste around that? And um, you know, we found some really interesting ways, even on a shoot, to reduce 
the amount of waste in areas like that. So it's both strategic and tactical. Um, and you know, I, I guess the strategic piece is easier because you can make those big strategic decisions around partnerships. I think the tactical piece, again, you, you've got to make that work across the across the supply chain. We've made some small steps there, but we need to make more. Okay, great. Okay, we're, we're really um, short on time. So I'm, I just wanted to touch on, Karen, I think I'm going to give you the last word on this, given your um, your sort of historic role in, in a previous life uh, at a sort of broader industry level. I, but I think that, you know, the Ad Green Initiative, for example, has been mentioned a couple of times by everybody. And, and, and Fick, I think you talked about Ad Net Zero and you know, th- there are other things that have been talked about. I suppose my question just for you, Karen, is how, you know, partly how can the industry work better together to, to ensure that we all tackle this as one community confidently? Uh, because it feels as though there are lots of independent individual initiatives, all that have, you know, their own agendas, their own egos, their own things going on. Um, and, and also, should we feel positive? <laughs> are things moving in the right direction? Um. I agree there's a lot of initiatives, but the, there are some that show you know, great promise. And I loved what Tamara said about start by starting. And that's how I see in the Ad Green initiative. It's, you know, we're starting by starting with what we can change. But there, there are much, much bigger challenges as well. In, in, you know, what I think of as advertising marketing scope three emissions. So what you were referring to in the Audi example, Charlie. Um, and I think there, we, the, the best... Uh, potential for change is in in, in clients, uh, you know, clients like Board, like Unilever, like all the leading thinkers in those companies, because change will happen um, when the you know the money will will shape the way that people are thinking. So the way that clients are thinking and spending is going to affect everybody else and make change happen quick, most quickly. So do do I think there's cause for hope? Yes because all the companies that I've spoken to who are spending money on advertising are already thinking along these lines. And, it, you know, they, they'll lead the way for the rest of us. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. I'm sad to say we're going to have to cut it there. I could keep going for hours. It's been a fascinating conversation. Um, but a huge thank you to, to everybody here on the panel today. Uh, thank you for dedicating time uh, to, to the conversation. Um, and I have to say, I am leaving optimistic having had this conversation. I, I think the industry, you know, and, and brands and businesses, organizations, governments feel as though they are really moving this topic forward. I mean, obviously there is a, a huge journey ahead of us all, but I feel optimistic about it. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, and I will look forward to speaking again soon. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you, everybody. Nice to see you.